basically Doug's going to carry on now with the question and answer thing and if you want to ask him any uh, things about his technique. One uh, question that's given in to us from uh, Paul Rowley. Did you develop your style of playing by working with Keith Moon, i.e. an unconventional drummer who was perhaps never quite playing a sound beat? Very <laughs> diplomatic, but uh, John? Who asked that question? <laughs> Um, yeah, I suppose I got a, a lot of my style from Keith. Um, I could never quite hear him. I mean, it was before people got mic'd up on stage, and drums didn't get mic'd up, so uh, I could never quite hear what he was doing. He used to get onto uh, a drum break and not come off it quite as well as he should have. And he'd, um, I'd always have to be walking around. <laughs> Seeing what the hell he was doing with his bass drum. But, uh, no, he was pretty unorthodox, so it made me unorthodox as well, which, which helped. Go on. That's because I designed it. No, it's. Uh, yeah. See, I can still stand up. It's. It was designed along the lines of an explorer, which I found really easy to use. And uh, I just changed the shape around a little bit to make it look like a buzzard. <laughs> and we're, we're doing one for gays in pink. It's a flamingo, basically. It's actually got some quite functional things here. You can actually play it without a strap. This hooks, hooks onto the back of a chair if you haven't got a stand. <laughs> <laughs> it's a uh, Warwick. It's West German. They call it Warwick because they can't say their W's. It's a Warwick. Do you have any difficulty fitting your style in with the sort of music you're known for playing? Playing in heavy rock situations, a style which doesn't seem to accommodate quite easily. Um. Yeah, I mean, it was quite easy to fit in my style with The Who. Um, I've got a new band now and it's quite easy to fit in with them. It's uh, fitting in with what everyone else. Are fitting in with you, with your new band? Is it, are you picking the men to fit in with you? Uh, no, we've kind of got our own kind of music, you know, and we're sort of fitting in with each other. But, uh, you know, we're just making sure that we can allow each other to uh, do what we want at some point in the album or the act. There must have been a point where you thought, I've had enough of it. Uh, yeah, it was about a month after I started learning. <laughs> and I realised that I was expected to stand at the back of the stage and uh, play one little bar. You know, and, uh, I'd been playing piano and French horn and trumpet before that, and I was kind of in the, in the role of a soloist. And when I took up the bass, I kind of thought, well, this is a real shitty job. <laughs> and, uh, so I set about trying to change it. You know, I put a treble on so that it would actually cut through. And it does cut through. <laughs> um, and, you know, so I suppose I was influenced by Dwayne Eddy at an early age. I learned to play bass, playing twangy bass lines. And uh, when I was expected to play bassy ones, I didn't like it. Do you have a lot of problems in your mid-60s trying to get that sound and the equipment and the desks and everything wasn't a lot good? of problems trying to get that cutting sound and the equipment uh, wasn't up to it? Yeah, the main problem is scaling it down because yeah. you, can, you, can get, you, can get uh, you can get the sound on big equipment quite easily just by overloading everything. But uh, to actually get the sound in the studio, you need some kind of gain device. I mean, this is this Galen Kruger, which is a tiny little lamp on the top, is what I'm getting through the 412s. It's about halfway up. And you can actually plug that directly into a desk and get exactly the same sound uh, at low volumes. It's great. What did you do before all this gear came up? Turned everything up. <laughs> <laughs> and hope for the best. But I mean, you know, you've got engineers in the studio that didn't want to record it like that. They, you know, I'd give them all the treble sound and they'd cut it all out and just, by the time it got on the record, it was just a normal bass sound. Which was a drag, you know, so I, Thought to try and scale stuff down, but it's not until recently that I've actually scaled it down the small ends. Do you regret the fact that in the early years of the record, you're speaking? Do you regret the fact that in the early 
Um, I the early ones, yeah. all of them. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, I mean, you just, I, I've had a, a never-ending argument with producers that, uh, you know, they seem to have a bass drum blindness and get a loud bass drum and, and the bass is supposed to be somewhere underneath that, but I don't really believe in that. I think it should be up at least equal with the bass drum. And, uh, most people disagree. I mean, it's starting to get a little bit better now. Yeah. Basically, you still have all your collection. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, most of it keeps growing and decreasing. How many have you got there? Uh, I think I've got about four hundred pieces. Yeah. 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 We recorded it four times, and I went through three Dan Electro basses, and the strings kept breaking. And uh, when I decided that it was going to be recorded again, um, there weren't any more Dan Electro basses around, so I couldn't get strings for them. So when the strings busted, you had to put them on one side and buy another one. And, uh, I ended up playing a solo on a jazz bass with Labella strings. <laughs> uh, no, it's usually the microphone that got wrapped around the end of the bass. Uh, I hit the road manager once with the head of my head of my bass, and he fell back through the curtain. He was like, holding him up. And was, so, but um, no, symbols have cut through the lead. <laughs> Why have you changed from the Alembic to, uh, to the new bass? Um, well, the Alembic's the, the next back and forth too much. I get fed up with having to adjust them before every show or every time I use it. Um, also, I, I just get fed up with carrying around the, one of these little input modules. You know, I'm still carrying it around, but I'm not using it. I'm just using it as a splitter at the moment between the two amps. But they're, uh, the ones with graphite next are great, but the others, they just move around too much. The electronics are wonderful. Uh, um, I, I met Steinberger in New York and uh, I think he really hates me now. <laughs> um, I told him if I wanted to be a saxophone player I would have bought a sax instead of a bass. And then feel like it's supposed to blow down the end. <laughs> This, I mean, I, I like the tuning at the other end, you know, that's, that's nice, it's nice and precise. Uh, but if they stuck a head on it, there's some fake ones. Can you explain your two-handed tapping technique? Two-handed tapping? Well, the, the tapping uh, what do you mean, like hammer-ons or yeah, hammer-words? <laughs> What sort of electrics have you got on there? Is it parametric or...? Um, it's Warwick's Active Electronics, just standard Active Electronics with EMG pickups. Nothing really special. Is there a pickup with a pickup Uh, well they're just, uh, precision pickups which you always split. Um, I thought it would be a nicer arrangement in a V. <laughs> 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 yeah, if I can find him. Then, uh, people started calling him Winnebago Joe because he was living in a mobile home outside the studio. And I, 
I keep hearing reports about him. You know, he changes his phone number once a month, so the only way I can contact him is through a computer <laughs> modem, and uh, he's not using it anymore, so he's lost. Uh, I kind of like working with an old professor. You know, he's not at all how you expect it to be. He gets up and he's got his little glasses on and he's like a little old professor until about two o'clock in the afternoon and then he wakes up. And then he stays up until five the next morning. Thank you. Did you ever feel like leaving the Who at any point? Did you ever feel like leaving the Who at any point? Yeah, every year. Um, yeah, when you're in a, a band that long, you're bound to get different musical ideas, and uh, we started getting that way. And it was okay because one, someone would always give in. Uh, and then we got to the stage where no one was prepared to give in, so that's when it folded. If Ox had started to take off, it was Ox, wasn't it, your own band? Yeah. If um, it had started to take off, would you follow it? Yeah, but I would have had to, I would have had to rehearse with another guitarist because I was about to strangle him. <laughs> and, uh, the Who suddenly came up with 18 months work, solid work, so I thought, well, 18 months with the Who is better than 20 years trying to earn the same money. <laughs> How do you like to set your waist up to turn the action to string agents and so forth? What's that again? How do you like to set your waist up to turn the action to string agents and so forth? Uh, with the strings on the other side of the fence. <laughs> 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 um, yeah. I like it as low as possible, you know, because I, I've got a method of playing where I don't hit the strings that hard, you know, I let the amplifier do the work and, and the resonance of the string, and uh, they have to be set real low. I mean, I've played other people's bases that I can get my hand underneath. Uh, I get blisters that way, I think. When you were smashing up instruments in the hood, did you ever get to the end of the set and you were smashing them and you thought, bloody hell, what have I done? And it's, uh, not really, I mean, you knew what you were sort of doing. You know, knew you were smashing up a guitar, and you knew which way it was going to be, except uh, at one time, Peter just bought an old uh, Sunburst Les Paul, and the road manager handed it to him by mistake at the end of the act. <laughs> and he, he didn't even bother to look at it. You know, he was just playing, and he was just singing it with Mike, and he threw it in the air, and I saw his face when it was coming down. <laughs> And he had to smash it, you know, he had to smash that instrument. He couldn't actually get the road magic given that one, because the audience would have thought, ah, oh, that's a funny. Why did you smash your instrument? Sorry? Why did you smash your instrument? Uh, safe to still an encore. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it was, it was frustration, you know, frustration with, with the gig, the shitty dressing room, the promoter that's trying to do you, you know, um, the audience the music we were playing at that time. I mean, when we got to the, the Tommy stage, we dropped it, but uh, it was fun while it lasted. We still did it occasionally. Later on. <laughs> when the Who was given in the theatre, did you ever feel like giving up that stuff? We couldn't. Which we did. <laughs> that was the only means we had of actually sort of getting any money, was to carry on playing. Uh, we were probably one of the only bands that got paid for doing good stuff. Um, because we insisted on the money before we went on. Uh, because we would have gone bankrupt if we hadn't picked up that money. You know. This was our lifesaver, we had a quarter of a million, so we needed the money. So it's money talk. <laughs> <laughs> you find it very frustrating to make yourself a business for us. Yeah, I think you should get a microphone out there. Did you find it frustrating to find yourself a business for us? Um, no, because there was only uh, there was only three of us up there, and um, people were dealing mainly chords, and uh, Keith filled in all the other gaps. I had to do a bit of lead guitar and cool. bass work at the same time, so it all kind of slotted together wow. very luckily. Otherwise, we could have sounded like a complete mess. We did, not it? What do you think of Trey Selling? Here was the question, John. Is that, is that someone from Trey Selling? <laughs> Uh, One, two. I've never worked out whether it's an amplifier or a girl that I used to know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this, uh, this 
Samsung's bass amp seems to be pretty good. Mm. I mean, it's, it, it's very easy to get an amplifier now that sounds good and clean on bottom end. The uh, difficult thing is, is getting something that uh, supplies the right kind of top for what I'm doing. With the question, stage, yeah. Sorry, the question was, are you playing the lead parts on uh, with the who? On stage, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the sad thing about bass playing is that you put down a really good bass part on a record, and then the lead guitarist comes along and fills with the rest of the gaps in. Uh, but then when you get out on stage, and the lead guitarist has only got one track, he's doing it live, then you have to fill all his gaps in. It's, uh, kind of a vicious circle for bass players. What sort of track is your new band going to play? Uh, Fox Trucks, Walsh's. <laughs> <laughs> Just heavy rock, heavy melodic rock. And bar mitzvahs. <laughs> What's that? Sorry? Have you changed your style or what? No, no. It's, uh... It's kind of fitted in, you know, we, we, we spent a lot of time uh, recording at first and, and we realised that we were doing it the wrong way. I and mean, we spent six months doing the album and then we did the whole thing again because it, our styles weren't standing out and, and uh, the new version's a lot better. But um, no, I can't change my style, really. I can play straight bass, but uh, that's not what I want to do. Once I get out on stage, I'm not going to stand there and play that straight bass part anyway. Mm -hmm. I'll be uh, trying to do the lead guitars. <laughs> <laughs> the little one. It's uh, Galen Kruger. It's um, West Coast American. It's about 50 watts a channel. And uh, I'm using it just to do the two 412s. They do more powerful amps, but this, this one's got a, a gain control on it that's pretty unbelievable. Well, I'll show you what it does. <laughs> creative musician. I wasn't writing songs, so it didn't matter. Um, that's why I did all the solo albums, you know. Uh, there has to be some outlet. And uh, you get to a stage where everyone's petrified of releasing a single by someone else in the band. You know, I mean, there are a couple of songs I wrote that weren't bad, that could have actually sort of become singles, but uh, paranoia set in. <laughs> Rotor sound. Same strings I've been using uh, for the last 18 years. Not the same strings. <laughs> <laughs> Change them twice, twice a day if I'm doing a sound check. I'm not getting for nothing, so it's okay. How often do you change the strings? Especially um, in the way you play. If, if I'm in the studio, I'll change them every two days. Um, as far as stage shows are concerned, if we've got a sound check in the afternoon, I'll have them change for the sound check and then change after the sound check again. So I just need that. When you've got a singer with three humidifiers on stage, the strings don't last too long. Did you show us a bit of that technique where you've got um the uh, tapping on the uh, on the board, you've got it at high volume and you're tapping with your right hand. Tapping?
harmonics over the top to keep the note going. <laughs> two fingers. Sit down and just learn his style. Just to see what it's like. No. <laughs> <laughs> no not, not, not that I'm conceited, but I, I had to really sort of. My, my way of becoming me was to disregard a lot of stuff that was going on. Yeah. Otherwise, I'd, I'd be thumb slapping now. And, uh, I don't do that. Typewriters do. <laughs> <laughs> Must have had it. 